On September 18th of 1997, London's Royal Academy of Arts opened the doors to their latest groundbreaking exhibition, a visceral, near-pornographic deification of all that would normally be considered despicable and abhorrent. The exhibition, aptly entitled Sensation, was nothing short of an overwhelming success. Among its forward-thinking collection were works such as Zygotic Acceleration Biogenetic Desublimated Libidinal Model, which was a fiberglass sculpture of several conjoined and naked young girls, some with anuses for mouths, and others with semi-erect penises for noses. A giant portrait of Myra Hindley, the British woman who, with her husband, had sexually abused, tortured, and murdered several British children in the pursuance of a supposed pagan ritual, was another one of the thought-provoking works on display. While supposedly intended to raise a question about the exploitations of children in society, the fact that the portrait itself was created with the palm prints of young children, who were too young to appreciate or understand what their participation might entail, was apparently lost on the curators. Now, if any of this strikes you as being too inappropriate or taboo, you're clearly just narrow-minded, and you don't understand the purpose of art. As Norman Rosenthal, the chief of exhibitions at the Royal Academy, put it, It has always been the job of artists to conquer territory that has been taboo. Artists must continue the conquest of new territory and new taboos. So, is art simply the breaking of taboos? Would the depiction of a gang rape, simply because it's taboo, now be considered art? To be a man of true artistic taste, such as Rosenthal, you need to have a modern sense of sophistication. You must possess a sensibility that nothing can offend or even surprise, that is ironclad against shock or moral objection. Such artistic taste requires that you indeed have no standards at all to be violated. Ultimately, this supposed sophistication is not sophistication at all. Rather, it is the beginning of barbarism. A fantastic example of the moral confusion generated by such progressive approaches to art comes to us in the example of Dead Dad, another piece of quote-unquote art on display at the exhibition. Dead Dad was a scaled-down but hyper-realistic silicon and acrylic model of a naked corpse. Said corpse belonged to none other than the artist's own father. But be not mistaken, this was no act of revenge on a tyrannical and abusive father. Rather, it was an outpouring of filial piety. The artist in question stated, and quite sincerely so, that he had created the model to honor his deceased father. This is a prime example of the moral confusion generated by a postmodern approach to art. When filial piety displays a father's naked corpse, complete to the last pubic here, to the idle gaze of hundreds of thousands of strangers, then honoring one's father and one's mother becomes indistinguishable from dishonoring them. When respect and hatred, or love and loathing, can both generate the same artistic product, then it's clear our sensibilities have been completely eroded out of existence. In order to recover a healthy and worthwhile approach to art, we need to lay out a few guidelines. The first is the idea that civilized life cannot be lived without taboos. Not only that, but some of these taboos may in fact be quite justified, and therefore, Taboo is not, in and of itself, an evil to be vanquished. Next, we need to reintroduce the idea of morality into the arts. While there is nothing wrong with depicting the vulgar coarseness or underside of everyday life, it matters how we go about it. William Hogarth and Thomas Rowlandson are two examples of artists who, despite their subject matter, remained aloof from the phenomena they depicted. They could criticize their subjects even as they laughed with them. To these artists, the modern art connoisseur's automatic equation of morality with bigotry and narrow-mindedness would have been appalling. Lastly, we need to reinstate standards for what constitutes true artistic virtue. As it stands, today's art circles would have us believe that a work's mere originality is what makes it valuable. That's why artists like Damien Hirst can create something as vapid as a sheep bottled in formaldehyde 
and get away with calling it art because, quote, no one did it before. To get back on track, we ought to revisit the great artistic achievements of the past. We need to explore the work of artists like Da Vinci, Vermeer, Caravaggio, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, Michelangelo, and Monet. A quick comparison of their work with any of the pieces of the Sensation exhibit will reveal how much we've allowed ourselves to be cheated of true beauty in a worthwhile artistic experience. By finding our footing in the exceptionalism, virtue, and artistic rigor of the greats, we can develop our generation's own art by building on what's come before, not by spitting on it and setting it aflame. If anything can be art, then surely nothing is. If we want to live in a society with any conception of morality, any sense of right and wrong, or any notion of beauty, then we need to hold our art to such standards. For as goes art, so goes the very core of who we are.